Now we're going to meet one of the great ladies of the movies, one of the great ladies of the theater, Miss Lillian Gish. And Lillian, it's so nice to see you again. I wonder if I can crowd over in here and you say hello. Certainly have. Who are you having nice coffee? Nice to see you again. I think Will I'll have, have some. some. Yes, may I have some coffee? I'll have some coffee. Lillian, <laughs> well, when you went overseas, we found out at that time that you were going over for Theater Arts Magazine. You were going to sort of browse around Europe and look over the theater situation in general. I now know. we're ready for a report. Well, it's pretty nice, the theater in Paris. It's in the hands of the artists. That is, a man with money just can't come into the theater and do a play. He has to get the consent of the author and the actors and the people all engaged backstage in the theater. <laughs> Consequently, it's doing very well. There are over 50 theaters running in Paris. That's even more than we have in New York at present, Even I think. more. I think we, we haven't one-fourth of that running. 36, in. I think. Oh. No, I'm wrong? No, Probably. I don't <laughs> think so. I, I hope you're right, but... Well, you're, you're I right. hope you're right. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, oh. That, that should be a very happy uh, situation, then, when the theater, as you say, is back in the hands of the artists and doesn't depend on, on the monetary situation as we do in New York. Well, it seems to be healthier because I looked at the theater schedule in New York and we had 12 plays running at the time. They had 50 in New York, in uh, at Paris. <laughs> oh, thank you, aren't you, Tom? Thank you. Well, Lillian, uh, how about movies? Uh, I think, uh, let's see, the last one I saw you in was uh, Doodle in the Sun, was it? Do you, no, uh, Portrait of Jenny. Portrait of Jenny. David Selznick's film. Well, I didn't see that one. I missed that film. Uh, but I saw one of uh, catch up <laughs> on your movies now. You can't be devoted primarily and always exclusively to television, well, good as it is. Lillian, I have a wonderful story that I want to ask you about. I came across it quite accidentally, and yeah. the thing really tore at my heart when I heard about it. What's that? And I want to ask you for verification of it. It may not be true, and it may uh -huh. be true. I'm going out on a limb. But it was in the early days of uh, you in the movies when you were uh -huh. making a picture with D.W. Griffith, I think. The Birth of a Nation, to be exact. And at that time, it was one of the very first movies, wasn't it? It certainly was. If not the very first, real big picture. Uh -huh. And at that time, you went out to Hollywood, you and your sister and your mother. Yes. And uh, your mother did all the costumes for you and your sister. She sewed them, more or less, and, and made them up. More or less, yes. But here's the big point of the story. Now, I'm going to have to have you tell it, though. Uh -huh. It seems that the halfway through the picture, they ran into financial difficulties, and you and your sister contributed 500 bucks or something oh. like that to finishing the picture. We tried to. Oh. We had $300 to our names in the world. And we went to Mr. Griffith and said, please take this money. We'd like to invest in this film because we believed in it. And he wouldn't take it. Why? Because it was all the money we had in the world. Oh, because I Because we might lose it. <laughs> but at that time, the picture was sort of halfway completed, and, yes. and they couldn't get yes. any more financing It's quite for true. It. It's quite true. But he went to the people that had dry goods shops and shoe shops and uh, uh, other people per, uh, that had money and raised a thousand here, five there, and, and so forth. But he wouldn't take our 300. And how sad, because that picture cost $90,000 and made $60 million. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, if, if he had taken your $300, you probably would have gotten about uh, 100%. Oh, no, oh, 1,000, million I'm percent good, return. I'm not good at arithmetic. <laughs> but that ruined the, the movie industry because it became then like m General Motors or steel. It was a big industry. And it was taken right out of the hands of the artists, such as D.W. Griffith, mm. and put into the hands of big business. I don't say anything against big business, but they're not artists, usually in the emotional sense. But that story is true, though, about you Absolutely offering, offering true. money. Absolutely I, I, true. I thought it was wonderfully presented when I heard mm -hmm. it. And I wonder, Lillian, if I might ask you now, we're going back to, what was it, 1905 or 1911 when Birth of a Nation was made. Oh! No? 1911. 1914 or 15. 15. Oh, we're Look in the war you. then. Look at you. <laughs> uh, I would have been two years old. No, I'd been uh, five years old. Five years old. You started in the theater when you were six. No, I was five in five? the theater. In Ohio, I think. In, yeah, uh, yeah. Cincinnati I was five Friday. in the theater. My sister was four. Four. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the difference in making movies in those days and the yeah. differences today. You know, uh, back uh, when you made Birth of a Nation, you had the hand cameras and everything. Well, then you had to work very hard, 18 hours a day. You didn't get very much money, but you had the satisfaction of, of creating something that you believed in. It was really the golden age of films. 
Not the golden age by way of dollars, but the golden age by way of accomplishment and satisfaction. Those were the happy days and the happy people in them. In those days, though, we didn't have the fan magazines and the fanfare sort of uh, attendant to stars that we do today. What was it like? How did you gather your public? Well, there, it was, there was a mystery about you in those days. For instance, you'd be riding on the subway and someone would start to speak to you and then stop and say, but I know her, but who is she, you know? And they didn't know what it was, but we knew. <laughs> it was more fun. It, it should have been more fun, too, because uh, in those days the films were silent and they never got to know your voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I imagine they lost a good deal of your personality, too, that way, by not well, having heard your voice. I don't think so. I think that it was a greater challenge to uh, the people acting in the films to be articulate without words than now when everything's written for you. <laughs> well, Ellen, you're one of the greatest stars that Hollywood oh, has ever had. Come, come, come. Well, I think that seriously. Well, that's sweet, that's and sweet. I'd, I'd like to ask you what your greatest experience in show business has been, not only in the movies, but also in the theater and show business in general. Oh, my greatest experience was being raised by the people of the theater who taught me to read and write and looked after me as a child growing up. And I love them. Then well, there's no business like show, like show business. business. <laughs> Were your mother and daddy in the theater? Mother was, not my father. And yet, when you went out to Hollywood, um, at the age of five or six years old, you were a very poor family then. We were very poor all through our childhood. We were in the legitimate theater through our childhood. And then we went to the uh, films when, well, I was 12. Did you ever do any of the, uh, the serials like Perils of Pauline? No. Man? You know, those action oh, no. things? No, we were a little above that. <laughs> <laughs> you were of the we uppy sex. We were of <laughs> Mr. Griffith's school. <laughs> well, I thought he had made some, didn't he? No. No, no. nothing like no, that. No, he trained the people who made those, but he didn't himself make any of them. I wonder if you had time to uh, make any observations as to how television might affect the movies. Oh, I think television is wonderful. Tell me now. Let me interview you. What about this production of Rose and Cavalier? At the, the Metropolitan? Oh, oh, that must have been went exciting. Off, yes, went off very, very well. And, uh, you know, it was it was more than that. It wasn't just a straight production. They went backstage, and we met uh -huh. the stars, and we met the technicians, and then we sort of got a shot of people in the lobby and, and uh, relaxing in between acts and so forth. So it was more than just seeing an opera, I think. It was it rounded must out. Have been. It was much more intimate. That's it's right. like seeing Churchill when he's speaking. Because you see every expression in his eye, and he looks just like a baby, you know, and, and all those little things he does with his nose. And sounds it, like he, he's one ever of so much better. Sounds like he's one of your favorite characters. Well, he's one of the best actors in the world. Why shouldn't he be? <laughs> Well, Lily and Gish, I want to thank you for chatting with us today. We're sort of running out of time. Great pleasure, and I want to thank the DeGrasse and its merry crew for a good voyage over. It's been wonderful, in spite of bad storms and <laughs> bad weather. It's a nice ship, and I think wonderful that, uh, ship. generally speaking, a cruise or a trip on the North Atlantic is always worth the time involved and the money. Always, when it's on the DeGrasse. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Lillian. Thank and so, you. friends, we come to the end of your Ship's Reporter program for today. Yeah. Ship's Reporter is produced on film by the National Television Guild and directed by Chick Vincent. Till next time, then, this is Jack Mangan and Lillian Gish, a very wonderful Lillian Gish, wishing you smooth sailing. <laughs>